Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to part two of this week's questions and answers show. Today is uh, July the 30th, 2019. Sorry about the interruption on the first part. You know, when you got dogs, stuff happens, right? So anyway, let's finish up. We, we don't have too much left anyway, so we'll get uh, to some other questions here. From Peter Brickley. Hey, Pete, what's your favorite Uriah Heap cover art for their LPs? All right, so plain and simple. I love the Roger Dean stuff the best, so obviously Demons and Wizards, Magician's Birthday, and uh, Sea of Light. Great cover art, but I'm also a huge fan of the Abominog album cover art. That beastie with the red cover, man. Love it. I remember seeing that in the stores when it first came out, and I was like, I gotta have that. Um, <clears throat> also, I like the Salisbury cover art, but I like the uh, the UK version with the, the tank as opposed to the U.S. version, which I think kind of sucks, but the uh, with that little weird creature on the front. I think, uh, in fact, Heap had some different cover art for a lot of their, a few of their albums from the U.K. and here, and most of the U.K. ones are, are definitely better. Uh, Wonder World, I always thought was kind of a cool album cover. You, know, you got the guys in the band sitting on top of these little platforms, kind of almost look like statues. I always kind of dug that. Uh, High and Mighty's kind of neat. I think I believe that's a Hypnosis album cover art. Kind of looks like for um, Wishbone Ashes' first album. And then uh, Raging Silence is a pretty cool cover with that kind of face on there. And then I, I like the Wake the Sleeper album cover. That's pretty neat. Well, the last couple have been pretty good. Uh, what do we got here? From Caspar Bylock. Pete, I thought of a question for you. As an eclectic t-shirt collector, how jealous of you of my original Led Zeppelin at Nebworth shirt? Well, dude, until I see it, I can't really be jealous. I'm taking your, I'm taking your word that you actually have one, which I think is cool. Would love to see it. You know, maybe you should go over to the uh, See a Tranquility Facebook page and post a picture of your shirt. Then I'll be jealous, okay? But yeah, no, that must be pretty cool to have that. From Marty Martin. Hi, Pete. My question is, why are song titles not copyrighted? Although I'm glad they are not, I've noticed many, many bands have different songs with the same titles. With lawsuits being brought against bands about lyrics, Iron Maiden, Hallow Be Thy Name being a recent one, where some guy claimed they stole a line from the song, makes me wonder why song titles were not copyrighted. I, I don't have an answer for you. I think if song titles were copyrighted, we'd have a lot less songs, wouldn't we? Because how many times have you seen numerous tunes okay by various different artists and bands with the same title i mean it's just it's happened forever so the fact that you know yeah that would be real difficult that would because i mean you know how, how many original song titles can you come up with when when you've got like thousands and millions of artists putting out new stuff every year it's just it's crazy when you think about it but yeah everybody's you know <clears throat> God, that those those two words in that song were ripped off from me. I mean, I got to block that artist from singing that song ever again. I mean, Jesus, come on, get off it. You know, it's like it's amazing how we live in a society where everybody wants to sue someone else for something, right? It's just crazy. From uh, MBF78, who is your favorite or who are some of your favorite female rock vocalists? Okay, so... All right, uh, we'll answer this one again because it's kind of related to the other one, but I've gotten so many questions over the last couple of months about people wanting me to talk about my favorite female singers and female artists. Like, all right, hopefully I've answered them all this week, all right, because you're going to get all of them. So, but I, it's an, I still see them week after week after week, people want to know about, uh, you know, female singers and female product singers, female metal singers, female guitar players, female this, female that. It's like, you know, and, and so I've... I think you guys have already know I do listen to some female vocalists in different genres, but I don't I don't have a wide berth of, of ones that I listen to. So hopefully today we've answered a lot of them. I have nothing against it because I you know, I love females obviously. I love women and I love female musicians and singers. I just um, for whatever reason I tend to gravitate more towards male <clears throat> singers. That's just always been me. Um, don't know why. It's just the way it is. Not that I don't appreciate female singers. And most of the musicians that I listen to, not that there aren't great female musicians out there, so of course they are, but um, most of what I listen to happens to be male-dominated music. Look, I don't know. It just worked out that way. I don't plan that. Uh, so anyway, so uh, MBF78 uh, talks about how he's always like Karen Carpenter of the Carpenters. Uh, that voice just makes me feel good inside. And how about Dora Pesh? All right, well, I already talked about Dora Pesh. I like Dora. Um, we, you know, I've already talked about Heart 
ad nauseum. I think Ann Wilson is one of the greatest rock singers ever. Uh, Pat Benatar, I'm a fan of. I like Pat's voice. I always liked Debbie Harry, that early Blondie stuff. Was totally into her back in the day. Dora, we talked about. Uh, Annie Haslam from Renaissance. I adore Annie's vocals. Okay, Floor Jansen, originally from After Forever. Great symphonic metal band. She now is fronting Nightwish. She's the real deal, man. She's great. Uh, Simone Simmons from Epica. I adore her. She's wonderful. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give props to Karen Car Carpenter. I love the Carpenter stuff. Okay. Old Olivia Newton-John, man. She did it for me, right? Great, great voice. So there, there are plenty of female singers. I'm missing a lot of them, but uh, I think you kind of get the point. I do like a fair amount of female vocalists, maybe just because I don't talk about them because, you know, I prefer male vocals better, but it's just me. From Matty Boy Walker, <clears throat> Pete, you mentioned you have two 160 gig iPods which hold a big chunk of your CD collection. I also use an iPod when walking or I'm at the gym, etc. Since 2014, iPod Classics has been defunct, but since it's become st secondhand sales and prices have went through the roof. Do you think this will make a big memory player? Do you think this will make a big memory player solely for music return instead of using smartphones with so many distractions? All right, I'm trying to decipher your uh, your question here, Maddie. Uh, well, first let me get to, to one of you. Um, you can now get either refurbished or and, or used iPod Classics, 160 gig iPods, for pretty cheap. I just bought one because I had one that kind of died on me. It just wasn't taking a charge anymore. And I went and bought one, 160 gig, practically new, was used, but new, fully clean, okay, for 120 bucks. And it's working great. Okay, so you, you can go just go on eBay. There are plenty of people selling them. Uh, they're either selling refurbished or selling, you know, used. In other words, bought, barely used, stripped clean, ready to go um, for, you know, any, I've seen some as low as like 80 bucks. So, whereas like a couple of years ago, yeah, you, you, you couldn't buy one for like $500. Now it's like there's plenty of them out there. Because people like you or me who have had them and have decided to say, I'm just going to go to my phone and use my phone for everything, people are now selling them, right, for fairly cheap. So you can get them out there. Uh, do, do I think that they will make a big memory player solely for music? I mean, I don't know why they discontinue, you know, because there's going to be people like me. I'm sorry, but I don't want to spend $1,200 on a phone that's got just because it's a, you know, because, you know, Nowadays, people want to, don't want to carry multiple things, and the phones are so damn big. Would it be fantastic if they sold, like, uh, you know, and the problem is all my stuff is in, is in iTunes, so it makes, I would have to, if I were to do that, go that route, because I don't have an, an, an iPhone, I've got an Android, I've got a Samsung Galaxy uh, S7 Edge. So for me, putting music from iTunes onto that is not the easiest thing in the world. I'm sure you can do it, but it's a pain in the ass. Now, if I had like a, you know, one of those newfangled iPhones that have, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90 gigs, whatever it is, there's, I know there's one that's got a shitload of memory, that would make it easier because then I could put like a lot of my music or at least a portion of it on my phone. And I, but then I got, got to walk around the gym with this big ass phone, right? I, I like the the the, uh, the iPod is great because it's small, right? It just it fits in my pocket or it fits. I put a little. I got a little armband, you know, when I go to the gym. It sits right in there. It's like it's just great. It's so portable. So I don't know. And the problem is, it's like most people. Again, we keep talking about the masses here. Most people don't give a shit about walking around with 160 gigs worth of music. They don't care. It's like, oh, they'll just stream Spotify or iHeartRadio or they'll load up, you know, 50 songs on their, uh, you know, on their phone. And they're good with that because most people just want to hear the same shit over and over and over again. It's the people like us, right, who are all congregating here who would love to take this with them wherever they go, right, which is not easy these days. So I don't know, but there's a, I think there's enough people like us who would want something like that, right? I mean, would I love a uh, you know a 300 gig something or other that uh, basically takes everything I own <laughs> uh, wherever I go? Um, you know, granted, I don't, I don't, I very rarely, well, I shouldn't say very rarely, I don't use the, um, I use like the iPod when I go, like I'm out by the pool. I have a couple different like poor, you know. Wi-Fi speakers or portable speakers and what have you, and I hook that up to those and play stuff outside. But you know, in the house, I'm just always grabbing CDs. In the car, I'm always playing CDs. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. 
Technology, right? Uh, from Timothy Wills. Love the shirt, Pete. Where do you rank? Okay. All right. So my la I think the last question and answer sh uh, show, I was wearing my classic Chicago shirt that's got all the guys in the band and a live sitting on it. So uh, he goes, where do you, uh, Timothy goes, where do you rank Terry Kath on your list of guitarists? He was unbelievably good. Yeah, I mean, he's up there, right? It's got to be. Definitely underrated beyond belief. Such a talent, man. Could play like almost any style. And a great singer. I think if you, you know, we've talked about this before on this show. There's a lot of people who are like, oh, they think of Chicago. Or they. someone mentioned Chicago. They're like, oh, God, all those crappy 80s ballads. Yeah, but how about all the stuff they did from 69 to like, you know, 78? That featured Terry Kath playing all sorts of great guitar riffs and licks and solos and great vocals and all that stuff. He was like the real deal, man. So how do I rank him? I rank him pretty high. He's He's got to be. I mean, it's so hard ranking guitar players. But is he a top 25 guy? It's got to be, right? He's up there. So good. He's like one of those guys, you know, when, I, when I'm talking to people about my favorite guitar players, he's one of those guys that doesn't initially come up when I start because, of course, I start throwing out names like Blackmore and Shanker and Gary Moore and Iommi and Uli Roth and Jimmy Page and, you know, so on and so forth. Frank Marino and Steve Morris and Robin Trower, Pat Travers, you know, all those guys. But, like, as I start to get down the list, I'm like, oh, shit, Terry Kath. Another guy, uh, Billy Gibbons, okay? Those guys like that, man, so good, so good. From VolsFan90, <clears throat> hey Pete, I'm relatively new to your channel. You've got to be because I don't remember ever seeing that name before. I'm relatively new to your channel, so I apologize you've been asked this a million times. I know you're a hardcore Deep Purple fan, as am I. So my question is, why are Deep Purple's first three albums so underappreciated? I almost never hear anyone, fellow Purple fans included, talking about these albums or the several memorable songs on them. The song Anthem, for example, blows my mind every time I hear it, but it seems not many people know it when I list it as one of my favorite Deep Purple tunes. All right. Um, yeah, we're probably, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we're probably at the point of every possible Deep Purple question could have been, or has already been asked and answered by me, because they're my favorite band of all time, and I've talked about them so much. But this one, ironically, has never been asked before. So, okay, so here's my take. I like the first Deep Purple, the first three Deep Purple albums, I do. They're very different, okay? They are creations of their time. I mean, Purple at the time were basically a psychedelic pop band, you know, playing some rock too, obviously, but, you know, psych psychedelia was kind of rock at the time. And I think they were just still trying to find their way. And, I mean, let's let's face it, what, half those tunes on those first three albums? Maybe not quite half, but a good chunk of them were cover tunes. You know, done well, right? Done different than a lot of the originals. But So I think that a lot of people, whether they're, you know, hardcore Purple fans or casual fans, that was kind of like purple in their infancy. And most people think of classic Deep Purple as Machine Head, In Rock, Fireball, Burn, you know, Made in Japan, so on and so forth, Storm Ringer. Um, whereas that, that early lineup, still kind of fine in their way, right? Very, you know, as much as I like those three albums, you listen to them today, they're very dated sounding, all right? And that's okay, because they're a product of the times. So I think most peep to most people, that was that was still baby purple. And Deep Purple, as most people know it, didn't start till in rock. <clears throat> and I think that's why most people don't talk about a lot of those tunes. Even though, you know, you have some, you know, Bird is Flown and, you know, uh Ring That Neck and uh, Hush. And, you know, there are some very good tunes from those early albums. Uh, but a lot of cover tunes, right? And some stuff very psychedelic, which, you know, not a lot. Of, some people are just not into that. Especially like heavy rock fans, okay, who like Purple for the heavy rock stuff. To that, to them, that style of music, eh, you know, kind of flower powery type of thing, whatever. And I get that. But good albums nonetheless, right? Just Purple in their infancy. From Brian <clears throat> Newser. Said your name right this time, right? Thanks for the little clarification. It's not Nusser, it's Nusser. Pete, I have a question that I would be interested to hear your opinion. For 35 years, my hometown has held a yearly 10-day festival celebrating the arts, music, art, etc. 
with two orchestra concerts that always include a special guest performer. Actually, Kansas is performing with the orchestra this year on 727. Very cool. Actually, probably just happened, right? <clears throat> Curious to see here how that, that went. Uh, but it's one of the yearly midweek events that I am asking your opinion about. Each year, they have a tribute band perform. This year was a Jimmy Buffett tribute band called Bluff It!, but they have had a Tom Petty, a Queen, an ACDC, Led Zeppelin, etc. tribute bands in the past. What is your opinion on tribute bands? I have heard some that sounded okay, I guess, but I mostly feel like, what's the point? Are you not capable of writing decent songs on your own, so you have to play dress up and make believe? I realize that some of them probably make a decent living doing this, but why? What's your take on them, Pete? Thanks. <clears throat> it's very simple. And we've talked about this a lot on the channel, right? What do most people like to hear? They like to hear stuff that they know. They like to hear songs and music that are very familiar, right? So it's very hard nowadays for like a local band, <clears throat> excuse me, to go out and play original music. Why? Because most of the people who will go out to watch live music want to hear music that they know. Okay? And... Quite frankly, going forward, I'll use Tom Petty as an example. I'll use Queen. You know, I could use Zeppelin. All, I'll use all of them as an example here. <clears throat> Tom Petty's gone, right? There is no more Tom Petty. People still love Tom Petty. So why not start up a Tom Petty tribute band and play all the local clubs in your area or you know play the fairs and all that kind of stuff because people still love Tom Petty's music and still want to hear it. And if you got a guy who gets up there, maybe kind of looks like Tom Petty, sounds like him, the band plays the music to a T, people still want to hear those songs. I've seen a few Queen tribute bands that are fantastic. <clears throat> they just nail the vibe. They got a singer up there who sounds and looks like Freddie. It's fun, right? Zeppelin hasn't been a band, you know, for a million years. There's a lot of great Zeppelin cover bands out there or tribute bands, okay, that just that nail it <clears throat> to a T. So I think the reason why they're so popular is because people will pay money to go see and hear their favorite songs played by a band who is very true to the way the original band played and sang them. That's the way it is. Whether you like it or not, and, you know, going forward, when all these bands are no more, I, I, are we just all going to be content with with never hearing these songs played in a live setting ever again? I don't think so. Um, you know, I've been I've been going to see Leonard Skinner live for many, many years, and a lot of people will argue and say that Skinner themselves have been a tribute band for the last 20 years and, you know, whatever. But, you know, now that Skinner is winding down, you're going to see Skinner bands, tribute bands, popping up all over the place. Same is going to happen with Kiss, okay? And maybe Kiss needs to just go away and have tribute bands, because, you know. Um, but that's it's just the way it is. Uh, I, there, I see Allman Brothers tribute bands popping up left and right around here now, now that the Allmans are no no longer, right? I've, there's some very good, you know, Journey are still a, a viable band, but I've seen there's Journey tribute bands playing around here. Um, I, there's a couple Black Sabbath and Ozzy tribute bands playing around here. They're all really good. Because quite frankly, you know, you, you're not going to see Black Sabbath anymore. And if you're a real fan of the music of those bands, it's like, you know what? The next best, best thing is to get some group that gets up there and, you know, really does those songs well. Because people want to hear stuff they love. That's unfortunately the way to the same thing, you know, with the bands who are, you know, legacy bands who are still out there playing. They go on tour, right? They can't get away with playing a lot of their new music but because people just want to hear the old classics, right? It's the way it is. So that goes back to, you know, new young bands going out there and playing all original material. It's hard for them. It's really hard for them to, to get an audience based on music that they've never heard before. So unfortunately, it's, it's kind of the way it is, right? Uh, from Raymond Kaiser. Uh, we appreciate all that you do, Pete. I am a very eclectic person who can listen to everything from ABBA to ZZ Top. You know, I am a hard rock fan at heart. Having said that, I meet very few metalheads who will listen or embrace pop music. So my question is, how can you be a hardcore metalhead and prog rocker, yet tell us you enjoy Steely Dan, the Doobie Brothers, Hall & Oates, and Dan Fogelberg? I mean, the tastes have nothing in common whatsoever. So are you also eclectic, and do you have diverse tastes in music? Well, I think you just answered your own question, right? Tell us what makes you have the taste you do, and what must an artist, pop, hard rock, prog, or heavy metal have to display to make you want to hear their music? <clears throat> I mean, dude, I've got, 
I've got friends, one in particular that comes to mind, he's actually appeared on the show before, uh, who is listens to some of the most obscure extreme music you'll ever want to hear, stuff that even scares me, and yet he loves like 80s pop, 70s pop, 70s classic rock. He, you know, So anybody can listen to anything. Yeah, I think most people, if you've got an ear for good music and good melodies and strong musicianship, you can listen, whether it's heavy metal, classic rock, jazz, folk, blues, whatever, you can listen to just about anything. Okay. Now, in saying that, I detest <clears throat> hip hop and rap. Okay. Uh, electro pop and a lot of dance music doesn't do anything for me. Uh, old school country, eh, I'm not a big fan of that either. But I, I can dig. I can listen to you know classical music. I can listen to blues, a lot of jazz, all sorts of stuff. So it just you know 70s pop, okay, 60s psychedelia, uh, early rock and roll. I can dig all that stuff. You know, I I like to think I'm fairly well rounded. Is my true love like hard rock and metal? Yeah, and Prague not too far behind it. Yeah, but doesn't mean I can't like other things, right? I think uh, if you're a music lover in general, even though you may favor one genre over another, you can still listen to a lot of stuff. From Jif882. Hi, Pete. It's Mom, honey. Um, Dad, Dad was talking about meeting you uh, someplace, but call me back because I'm not sure where. Uh, so call me when you get a chance. Love you. Bye-bye. We're going to Joe Bonamassa tonight, so and of course I, I I call my father to say, hey, I can meet you halfway, and you can jump in my car. We'll go up to the to the venue, and of course that message didn't kind of get to my mother correctly, so I'll have to call her back. Anyway, <laughs> that's what I'm doing shortly after this call after this uh, show here. All right, back to GIF eight eight two. You have bands that sing in Swedish. Do you have CDs by bands that sing in any other language? I have a CD by a '70s French prog band called Mona Lisa. Okay, yeah, I mean, I've got plenty of uh, albums sung in languages other than English. I've got a ton, I don't know about a ton, but quite a few um, Italian progressive rock albums on CD by, by a number of Italian prog bands that sing in their native tongue. It's wonderful stuff. I've got plenty of albums sung in Swedish. Uh, I've got probably a couple that uh, by Norwegian bands sung in, Nor in you know, their Nor local Norwegian language. Uh, I've got some South American, mostly Prague, I think, sung in, uh, you know, the, was it, uh, Portuguese or whatever. So yeah, it's, um, and I've got a couple French bands. So I've got Ange and Mona Lisa stuff as well. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, as long as the vocals are done well and the music is good, I can dig with, uh, you know, some non-English language music. Okay. Maybe not a ton of it, but uh, I don't, if it's done well, I can get into it. From David Mitchell. Hey, Pete, David Mitchell here, the guy whose heart you put in a hole, or whose heart you put a hole in. <laughs> anyway, most of the time when you review CDs from artists old and new, you always seem to have a positive assessment of the music contained therein. That's fine, and I respect your opinion, or do I? All joking aside, are there any CDs or artists that you loathe or hate? I know you have no personal animosity against such artists, but unfortunately people often react to negative criticism much like they do to the current political environment. But God forbid we go there. So I pose to you, Mr. Pardo, how about your take on the artists and recordings you really can't stand and if they had never existed in the first place, no one would care? Well, <clears throat> I don't know about no one would care. I wouldn't care, all right? But I know plenty of people who would probably care if some of these bands I'm going to mention here went away completely. So... Uh, I've got no use for, I mean, you know, these, you've heard me talk about these before. This is no mystery. Uh, if poison never existed, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. Useless band, in my opinion. Uh, Motley Crue, while I did like their first two albums when they first came out, I've had no use for them ever since or anything else they've done. If Motley Crue went away completely and were forgotten off the face of the earth, I wouldn't lose any sleep. I would get up and go about my business. Uh, Nirvana, I know millions of Kids love them. A lot of adults still like them. Madonna, Nirvana just don't do it for me. Pearl Jam, I got no use for. Uh, sorry, guys, but Guns N' Roses, if there was never a Guns N' Roses, I wouldn't care. Okay? Uh, and on from different genres, and I, I detest both of these, uh, that, that character Pitbull, most useless recording artist of all time. Stupidest songs ever. I just don't see the appeal to any of that stuff. 
And I, so many people love his music. I'm like, God, my wife listens to Pitbull. And I'm like, oh, I got to get out of the room. Uh, same thing, too. You've, I've already said just a couple minutes ago that I really don't like rap or hip hop. I think Eminem is completely worthless. I don't see the talent. He's just a white guy up there talking, rapping, you know, stuff, trying to be someone else. Um, and I don't see it. So many people are like, oh my God, Eminem is a genius. Listen to those lyrics. I don't know. I look at the lyrics and I'm like, it's just a guy talking about his sorry life. I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know what's so genius about it. Again, it's just me. If you love Eminem and Pitbull, that's fine. You, I, I got to ask the question. I loathe both of those two artists and I have no use for the other ones that I mentioned. So there, that's like, and if they never existed, I'd be happy about it. From Meat Leaf, Sikloski. Uh, hey Pete, your channel is a blast. In your fa in your favorite band show, you mentioned three California thrash bands that you still listen to and love. What other thrash bands do you dig? Are there any younger thrash acts that you can think that carry the torch when the old school thrash acts pull the plug? Well, you know, of course, there's the usual suspects. I love old school Slayer, Megadeth, Overkill, Testament, Exodus, Creator, Destruction, Flotsam and Jetsam, Metal Church, Dark Angel, Death Angel, Possessed, Nevermore. I could go on and on and on. There's so many great. Um, Heathens and other ones. So many great thrash bands from like, you know, the 80s and 90s and what have you. But as far as like some of the newer ones, I, and there's so many too, you know, Lamb of God's been around for a little while, but they're a really good like U.S. thrash band. Revocation are terrific. Okay. Uh, Septagon, Sacral Rage, you know, Warbringer. There's so many really good thrash bands. So many of them. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the, of the newer breed, so many of them are coming out of the woodwork and a lot of them sound exactly the same, but still a lot of good ones, but still a lot of the old guard are still around, you know, which is great to see. From Marvin Battle Jr., hey Pete, do you have an issue with profanity in music? Are there some bands, albums, or songs that you don't like because you found them too raunchy or they went overboard on the cursing? Um, I found as I've gotten older, I don't mind, you know, a fuck or a shit here or there, you know, or whatever. Um... But like I've heard like some hip hop and R and B and rap stuff in recent years where they just like, you know, every other word is F this and F that and end this and end that. And quite frankly, it just it it really bothers me. I don't like I said, I don't mind like a touch of it here or there, but man, when you're making like the chorus is, you know, and every chorus you hear him saying it over and over and over again, I'm just like, God, I I just have I don't have any use for it. So yeah, as you so as I've gotten older, my tolerance for that has lessened okay i just uh, in the old days i wouldn't have cared i probably would have thought it was kind of cool but nowadays it's like yeah keep it to a minimum when it's when it's excessive in my opinion it takes away from what's really going on there from jamie laszlo i think most of us would agree that santana's first three albums are there are there or his best but what studio album would you put as the fourth best and what do you think of the 2016 reunion album santana 4 I, for one, thought it was overlong with too much filler. Uh, well, first of all, the, their fourth best album, without a doubt, is Caravan Sarai, which is actually the fourth album that came out, fourth studio album. Uh, that's fantastic. They put out a lot of really strong albums in the 70s. Uh, none of them are as strong as that one, and that, to me, is a that's a that's pretty much like a jazz fusion album. That's really good. Caravan Sarai is excellent. As far as like the Santana 4 goes, I really like it. Was it maybe overlong, one or two too many songs? Possibly. But man, they captured the spirit really well, I thought. It's a fun album. I saw them live on that tour. They were fantastic. So I dig it. I think it's a really good album. And even, even if three quarters of it is really good and the other quarter is not so great, that's still a success in my book because, man, Santana with most of the original lineup or the classic lineup anyway, getting back together in 2016 and putting out new music, I thought that was a success, right? But that's just me. All right, our last one for today from Anthony Perot or Perrault. I've noticed a lot of songs that sound a lot alike. My question is this. How much plagiarism do you think goes on in music? Is it because there has been so much music and it's just coincidence? I just see so many artists suing other artists or groups over copyright issues. Indulge me. Have you ever shed, and also, have you ever shed tears at a concert because it was this good? All right, well, I think we kind of already answered the first part of your question. Uh, you know, if you're someone who's a fan of music and you've been listening to music your whole life and you play music, there's no way that you cannot be influenced in your own writing and playing and recording by stuff that you've already heard. So yeah, I'm, there's plagiarism going on, whether it's intentional or not. I'm sure some is intentional. I'm sure some is not. It's, it, there's no way around it. There's no way that anybody can create a new piece of music nowadays 
that does not have something that's borrowed, whether intentionally or not, from something that was recorded 30 years ago, 50 years ago, two years ago, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, right? I mean, it's just, it's impossible. It's just impossible. And again, it's just that uh, it's all been done. So all we're really doing is kind of rehashing. Doesn't mean you can't come up with something really good. But there's always going to be little bits that are kind of rehashed from something else. It's just it's the way it is. I just don't think that anything that is ever going to be released from here on it is going to be absolutely 100% original. And if it is, if there is, hey, that's great. I, I highly doubt it, though. As for the your second part, have you ever shed tears at a concert because it was so good? Yeah, a couple times. Uh, I, <laughs> I cried the first time I saw Renaissance. Uh, during the last song when they played Ashes Are Burning, I shed a couple tears. It was it was amazing. Uh, the second time I saw The Who, I cried with tears of joy when they played... Um, um, oh, God, I'm drawing a blank. I'm drawing a blank on the freaking song. God, listening to you. I get, come on. Guys, help me out. It's it's. I've been talking for too long. I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, the last song on Tommy, right? I know the song's my favorite Who song. I just can't think of the name of the tune right now. Anyway, I cried during that because it was so good. What else have I cried at a show? I think I cried once at a Yes concert when they played Awaken. All right. Uh, I I was kind of crying, laughing, head banging with joy uh, when I saw the Black Sabbath. Um, Actually, it was Heaven and Hell. It was with the return of Ronnie James Dio when he got back together with the Sabbath guys as Heaven and Hell at Radio City Music Hall, which was filmed. I was there. Uh, I cried that night. I think when they played the song Heaven and Hell, I, I, was, I was crying. Um, when else did I cry? Jesus. I thought I would cry at Elton John this past winter, but that didn't happen. I, I really expected to, to be just mesmerized and blown away best concert ever and while I greatly enjoyed it it didn't really affect me like I thought because I, I love a lot of Elton John songs um so yeah that's about it I, there may have been a couple of other times but uh those are those are the main ones that I can think of so pretty cool right anyway this is on the web at www.seatranquility.org we're on Facebook we're on Twitter of course we're on YouTube often 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 so uh stay tuned we got a uh classic album war coming right up momentarily all right, and uh, otherwise, we'll see you every day this week with some more good stuff, all right? Take care, guys. Bye-bye.